and then I'm gonna go back up again. Yep. <clears throat> Send me an email here you know, through uh, Google. Oh, were you able to recover your work? The, no. Sure. I just. Uh, I'll get the information. I'll do my oh, It's blinking. Because it says. Uh, there we go. Give me a copy of the corrupted uh, work. Yeah, I'll see if I can prepare it. I'll just do it in my free time. No guarantees. Oh, it's okay. What I should have done is to program the projector to select the input from somewhere else. Oh. So that way I don't have to shut down the, uh, the lamp system itself. The reason why it's taking so long is because the lamp is uh, is not LED. It's not an LED light source, so it takes time for the light source to warm up and actually get to the full uh, intensity. Okay, so I just you know, went through the pay registration fee, which is not recorded. I just restarted the recorder, so you know, the, the the remaining portion is actually recorded. You know, so that's fine. Um, you have to include the developer name. Um, will appear for to users under the name of your application. So you know, in my case, I can just you know do the same thing here. I can say you know Dr. Tag apps here. Um, email address is going to be you know, this current account that I'm using. So I'm going to use Dr. Tag apps .gmail .com. and then the website is going to be the website that I just set up. So I'm going to use that one. And then for a phone number, include plus sign, country code, and so on and so forth. Why do we ask for your phone number? Um, well, you know, you know, I'm just going to include my cell phone number. I probably have to edit this part out of uh, the Google, uh, the video. The yep. Plus one. Mm hmm. Oh. I'd like to get vocational email about development and Google Play opportunities. No. Okay, complete the registration. I went through this process once already with my other account. And is it complaining about something or is it? There we go. All right, so now I'm ready to actually publish something publish an Android app on Google Play. I mean, that's basically what it is. I mean, we just have to go there. However, at this point, I have not set up a merchant account, so I cannot actually sell my apps. Okay, you know, I can distribute apps that I already have, but I cannot you know, actually collect money um, for apps that I'm selling. So if you're planning to create paid apps or in-app products, you need to set up a merchant account, and this is where you need to go if you want to get paid. You know, for your apps, and it requires you know all kinds of information, merchant information. So you can see why I need a website because you know, this is also asking me for a business website, which I can use you know, the other one for. Um, credit card statement name is not. Um, it's basically how do you want uh, the credit cards entry to look like on the people who are downloading your apps. Okay. Yeah, on the receipt. So this is not you know on yours, but it's on the other person's. <clears throat> In the customer support email, I can use you know this uh, this particular account too. Um, and then you have to select a primary product type. So you have to go through this whole list here and find out you know find which one you know applies to you. Or you can always select other you know if it doesn't you know fit one of these requirements. So I'm not going to go through this process because I'm not going to sell my app you know just yet. So I'm getting back to this console, and let's go ahead and see how we can you know, actually make an app appear into you know, the Google Play Store. So we go here, and then you know, that's basically it. You just have to you know, find a title or create a title for this particular app. I'm going to use my DBT Diary Card app here. So Diary Card. And I would use the upload APK method to do this. Right. So now I have to log in to my um, 
App Inventor website. And this time I have to sign in. Oh, okay. I just selected the wrong option because I used the other account to do this. All right. So when you're in App Inventor, the first thing you need to do is to get to the go to the right app. So this is my projects. Okay, go to my projects. Make sure you click on the right uh, project or the right version. Okay. And before you do anything, before you actually publish your app, one thing you might want to do is to take note of your um, version code as well as the version name. Okay, because that's one way that you can use to keep track of you know which version you are releasing. Because when you're testing it, you know, by yourself, you're just you know writing some, uh, making some additional changes. The version code or the version name really doesn't matter, okay? Because it's just you testing your own software. Once you publish it, people will have to will call you up and say, you know, my app is not running or it has problems and whatnot, and you want to know which version they're using because there might be issues that you are fixing or you have fixed already with a particular version. So you can tell them, oh, okay, this is not an issue anymore. We are now, you know, we have already fixed that feature or fixed that problem. So you might want to take note of your version code as well as your version number. One is just an integer. Version code is nothing more than an integer. It is only used internal to your application. Okay, it is, it's not visible from the outside. The other one, which is version name, is visible from the outside, and this one doesn't even have to be numerical. You can just say alpha if you want to. Okay, so I can say you know, 0 0.0 0.1 alpha. That's fine. Okay, so you got to make sure that you know you name your version code and also your version name appropriately before you actually publish your app, because you know you need to make people understand. Like in this case, if it's an alpha version. People look at it and go, okay, I understand you know, this is really just you know, experimental and things may not be working completely, but that's okay. Okay, if I can if I want to test it out, you know, I can still download it. Alright, so once you have that done, you want to click package for phone and select you know download to this computer. Because this way we will end up with an APK file that we can upload to the uh, Play Store on the other tab, and then we can publish our you know application. So maybe during the prosecutor work, because we all want to be uh, like um, the company that published Angry Birds. They made, uh, how many millions of dollars did they make, you know, in the first month? They basically became the, uh, the largest exporter of uh, Sweden. They beat Volvo. How are you mean exporting games? Yeah, yeah, how much money they're making. So they, they actually exceeded um, Volvo. At least in terms of you know, the, given a certain time frame, you know they were making more money than Volvo was you know, during that time frame. It's not really hard to beat Volvo because I think ABBA beat them too. You know, when ABBA was in its height, uh, the, the band, the music band, they were selling records. They, they were making more money selling records and doing the tours and whatnot than uh, Volvo was making uh, selling cars. <laughs> Sorry? You follow Volvo pretty closely. No, not really. Yeah, but I just you know, realized you know, it's a small country, right? I mean, it's a relatively small country. And, um, and it's interesting you know, what kind of stuff it exports, you know, what, what makes money you know, in that country. Uh, cars is one, you know, but now it's apps. So that's kind of Is kinda that sales plus advertising or just the sales? I think it's revenue. Okay, it's, it's just revenue, but that makes it even more interesting because a car sells for, a Volvo sells for what, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 at least. <laughs> and an app, you know. All right, so we have, you know, the APK file ready to go, and we'll upload. 
the app file, APK file. Oh, that's right. Yep, yep, I did. If I refresh, it will say, yep. <laughs> I like that. Fine. Go here and then um, click here and then say add account. There we go. can sign out the other account now, so I can just go ahead and sign out and sign in as a, my other account. Because I got the app already, so I can you know get get out of this one. Interesting. It took some of that information, but it didn't take the the rest of it. Okay. So now we have the app. Um, you can see it's version two. This is the this is the version number that is internal. So every time you uh, update your application, you have to make sure that you update this number. Okay. The other one, you know, is not as important, but this one is for your own tracking. So it's actually very important to um, keep track of this one. Um, set up beta testing for your app. Okay, so we'll go ahead. There's no APK in beta testing. This is actually alpha, so it's even worse. Um, so yeah, we should yeah. probably do that. And in production, we get rid of this one, right? Because it's not really ready for production yet. Uh, let's see. Do we have a way to delete it? Maybe status? Yeah, down there. What's alpha testing? Alpha testing is in-house testing. You know, it's not even ready to be released for other people to test it. And that's just details. It doesn't give me an option to remove it. Switch to advanced mode. Ah, right there. That's easy. Move to alpha. Okay. So now I switch to alpha testing, and here's my app. So are there any questions about you know, how to, you know, yep. Does Alpha testing, does it allow you to like download it uh, from your own account uh, other devices? That's a good question. It looks like you need to be in a list of approved testers though. Mm -hmm. You can manage a list of testers. Um, with Alpha testing, it is not released to the public. So that means you, know, you, can, you, can, you have to maintain your own list of testers and only those people can download it. If you move it to beta, I think you know it is available to everybody. So let's do that. Let's see you know, what happens when we move it to beta. And move my tab to oops, this one. 
only my tab to beta testing. And it still has a list of testers. And you can add Google to test your app. Once you have added a group, you have you need to send your testers an opt-in link below. Once they opt in, they will receive this version through Google Play. So it is still limited when you put it into beta. If you so is it just uh it's disabled until you add like a list or a group. So anyone can download it up to the point of you adding a list of approved people. I think nobody can access it unless you put them on the list. Now if you move it to production, then there's no you know list yeah. anymore. So basically, you know, at this point it is you know available to everybody. So you have to con you can you have some control over this you know you can control you know whether it's in alpha testing stage beta testing stage or in production which means now you know, if I save it everybody can actually see it you know in uh, Google Store. Okay. Once it's in production, you can move it back out of there if you want. Um. Yeah, I just did. Okay. Yeah, because I already saved it in production, but then I later on move it into you know alpha or beta. Yep. <coughs> So we'll go ahead and say, you know, click save. Now it has been saved, and we can go to store listing. I haven't really finished you know, the um, documentation, so I'm gonna finish this one a little bit here. So this is a an electronic version of the Kaiser DBT diary card. Okay. Only use this in Conjunction with a professional. Okay, there we go. And promo text is, you know, just something that is um, just a perk. Okay, you know, just basically a quick advertisement. Okay, so I can say, you know, sick and tired of carrying a piece of paper. Use. Uh, recent changes. This is the first release. Okay, so it's first release. Limited features. When you and search for an app, does it search all these form elements or just the description? That's a good question. I think it searches for sure the description. Um, so if there are some special text in the description, you know, it will look for that. Um, because that's what a lot of apps are very, you know, they have strange names. And that's why, you know, the, the reason why you can still find them is because, you know, it's also using these extra fields for, you know, searching. Okay, graphics asset, you know, you basically can uh, drag and drop, you know, screenshots. I'm going to skip all this stuff here. And you can see that, you know, you can add a different screenshot depending on the device. You can have one, you know, for smaller devices like phones, you know, basically three or four inch devices. Um, one for seven inch tablets and one for 10 inch tablets. Um, you can also create you know, different types of icon here. Okay, you can have you know, a high resolution icon. Um, and also um, feature graphics, you know, basically these are the things that get displayed when you go to the Google App Store. Okay, I didn't have time to prepare for any one of these, so I'm gonna just you know, leave all of these blank because I'm not selling the app anymore. Any anyway, I'm actually not counting on people you know downloading and ins installing at this point. It's really just to show you you know, through the steps here. Okay, category. Okay, it's an app. Application type is app. You know because they have a specific one for games. This is definitely not a game, and we'll call this. Well, that gives me you know, that 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 can tie me to certain liabilities. Oh, <laughs> I'll just say educational. <clears throat> well, maybe not. Let's see here. What op What else? What other options do I have that might be useful? Productivity. Productivity, health and fitness. Well, it could really tie you to liabilities. The no. Give you advice. Or well, I'm not giving any advice, you know, but, you know, people can say, well, I actually did not have an urge to hurt myself until I ran your app. <laughs> <laughs> you just reminded me that I want to hurt myself. I mean, where's my knife, you know? 
So that's you know, th that's the kind of thing that you know some people may you know come up with you know if they want to. Um, yeah, you you'll be surprised you know what kind of the people, what kind of reason people sue other people for. Have you guys heard of the case where um, I think it was a um, person who sued Winnebago? You know the um, yeah the trailer you know mobile home you know manufacturer mobile home is a mobile home manufacturer and uh, this person was suing the company for uh, the auto uh, the cruise control feature was not clearly explained that it is not autopilot <laughs> <laughs> so the person set it on you know cruise control you know hit the button the car seems to be driving at a constant speed you know seems to be driving itself because it was on the highway okay and then this person proceeded to leave the driver's seat, get to the back of the mini bagel to get something to eat. Needless to mention, the car crashed. And miraculously, this person survived and decided to sue the company. And this person, as a result, actually got rewarded a new Winnebago. That was it? Yeah. Well, you can just look up on the internet. I'm pretty sure it's not urban uh, legend. It was a while ago. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. But that's but that's the kind of things you know, that can happen. You know, you have cruise control, and then somebody thinks, oh, that means I don't have to be you know driving the car. Now these days we do have self-driving cars, which makes it even worse because some people may accidentally think, oh, you mean this is one of those you know Google Street Car things? You know, and I'll just <laughs> I can now go to the back and have a, have a beer, right? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> So I'm gonna, you know, put it in, you know. So I'll be very cautious about that sort of thing. And you know, if you put it under education or entertainment, you know, then you know the liability is going to be a little bit more limited, or at least people won't think of, oh, okay, this is for you know health and medical purposes. You can start an LLC and then like uh, do the app and do your company. <laughs> then you still have to, if I, if I remember correctly, an LLC, a limited liability corporation, still needs to pay. Um, Franchise tax board, the franchise tax, which I think last time was what twelve thousand, twelve hundred bucks a year or something like that. Yeah. So whether you make money or not doesn't matter. You have to pay twelve hundred bucks a year to become a corporation in the state of California. Um, a lot of people start companies, you know, at least they register in Delaware or Nevada. Or Nevada, you know, which are free. I think if I remember correctly, you, you don't have to pay an annual fee if you start a corporation in those uh, states. But you have you know, complications because when you sell stuff, you will end up you know, getting money into California. And I'm not 100% sure you know, how that works out you know, when your, your company is actually registered elsewhere. You probably have to have a bank account in that state. In that state? Yeah. So, you have to, so people will be paying to your account in that state. So you'll be charged state tax accordingly in that state? Okay. Okay, content rating. Um, basically, you know, it's basically saying, you know, what type of uh, maturity applies to your app here. Um, I don't know. I think this app, you know, is okay for everyone, you know, except, you know, for the, you know, urge to harm self. You know, that part is, you know, kind of iffy. So maybe we'll just... If you're not sure if you select high maturity, you know, that can always be an option. Uh, because the only complaints you can get when you say you know, high maturity when it's not is for people who download the app expecting certain things and say, hey, this is not the kind of app that I'm expecting. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay because most of the time those people won't sue you. They just move on to the next high maturity app you know, and see whether they can get what they're looking for. Right? So, uh, Table say for uh, that's underneath there. Going for it to expand that re the information about the rating. Okay, so maturity can relate to all of these things: alcohol, tobacco, and drugs. So my app definitely doesn't have any one of that. It doesn't have gambling. Doesn't have hate. Doesn't store location, profanity, or crude hum hum humor. Has no sexual or suggestive content. Um, Suggestive in this case, you know, has to do with you know sexual suggestive. So in my case, you know, there's nothing like that. User-generated content and user-to-user -user communication, there is that, right? Because it's logging the emotion state or the urge, you know, of you know that person. 
So you know, apps related to everyone must not host any user-generated content or enable communication between users. In this case, I'm not hosting anything because it's stored on the device, but it is still content that is stored on the device. So I'll be careful about this. I mean, you know, that's, so I would definitely not pick you know, everyone you know, just because of this clause here. Uh, violence, apps that contain mild cartoon or fantasy vi violence must be rated low maturity or above. Now in this case, my app doesn't have cartoon or fantasy violence, but it does mention, you know, urge to harm self, right? So that by itself can also be interpreted as, you know, related to violence. And so definitely, you know, I would, I would rate my app at least at, you know, low maturity for those particular reasons. Are there any questions about this? No. Yep. For to sell your apps, you know, like how does that work? Like, does it go directly to your bank account and then like you have to list that as revenue? Like, do you have to use it? Is it under special conditions or? I have not gone through that process, so I'm not a hundred percent sure. Most of the time, you know, it would link it to an account where you can receive payment. Um, Google has its own, you know, wallet, you know, service, so it doesn't have to use Amazon or PayPal or one of those other types of way of getting money. Um, in terms of taxes, I don't think Google does a single thing about reporting your taxes, so you probably have to deal with all of that stuff yourself. Um, because you know, people sign up for Google accounts or they can sell apps from different states, so you know, I'm not even sure, you know, whether state tax applies to you know income sources you know that are you know generated this way. Well, if you have an AdSense account, they send you a, uh, a payout schedule. They tell you how much you pay. Oh, they do have a yeah. okay. Because it's income. It's income, so it will give you a ten ninety nine form. Is that what it's going to give you? I believe so. Yeah. Okay, but a ten ninety nine is still there's no tax withheld, um, so you are still responsible yeah. for paying your own taxes. Because what Google is really doing in that case is, you know, they have your social security number, so they will basically tell the IRS that you are making this much money from this source, and that's the liability or that's the responsibility of Google, and that's it. So you have to take your 1099 form and then, you know, work through your own taxes and pay taxes for the income that you're getting from selling your app. So that's that makes sense. I mean, that's you know, basically you know how it really should be. It's you know just the you know, Google just informs the IRS you're making you know this much money and you are responsible to pay the taxes accordingly. You're gonna answer your other question. Okay. Businesses are required to collect and pay a sales tax when they deliver products and some services to a state in which they have a physical presence. Okay. For online businesses. So how would you know? Well, that was kind of a blanket statement. Yeah. Say at the bottom of this consult here. You know. I think that applies to um, online stores that actually deliver um, actual merchandise to an address. When you're dealing with, you know, apps. But it's still online. It is online, but you don't know where it's delivered. In other words, you don't know the the residency of the person who's making the purchase. Well, the state always wants to collect as much money as it possibly yeah. can. <laughs> so I would say, you know, I would defer the discussion to a tax, you know, expert, you know, in this area, uh, just so that you don't, you know, end up, you know, misreporting your taxes. <clears throat> that that can be a very uh, detrimental kind of thing. It's in many ways, you know, worse than uh, messing around with the FBI or some other, you know, agencies. If I talk to you guys about uh, Al Capone, you know the mafia, the mafia boss. You know, do you know how he uh, ended? You know, what it, what was the ending of him? IRS. Yeah. Hmm? IRS. It was taxes. It was the IRS who took him down, not the FBI, not the for sure, not the police department of Chicago. <laughs> it was it was actually the IRS. He didn't pay. He did not pay his taxes. The IRS, you know, probably doesn't really care how he made his money, but the IRS wants to know how much money you're making 
and how much taxes, how much tax you are supposed to pay, and whether you're paying your taxes or not. So he forgot to hire an accountant for that purpose. <laughs> um, so I think the IRS basically ended up, you know, um, getting all his assets, uh, not throwing him in jail because he's not, you know, in in that uh, scenario. But he, he he met a really kind of bad ending, you know, because of the IRS. <clears throat> All right, so getting back to our app here. So I would definitely rate this one at least at you know, low maturity because of the reasons that I just mentioned. It's storing information you know, on the device itself. And contact detail, I don't have to leave my phone number here. I have my website, which currently is blank. Okay, there's nothing there. Uh, privacy you know, policy, if you wish to provide a policy, privacy policy URL for this application, Please enter it below. Um, I would say at this point, you know, since I did not prepare a policy statement, I don't have anything to link it to. But for an app like this, definitely, you know, have a you know privacy policy because you know I am storing information on the device. Okay, that can be considered you know private. Uh, it's the diary of a person. Yep. Is there like generic policies that you can just reference, or do you have to? pay someone to build one just for the app. Well, let's click learn more. Okay. Developer privacy policy. As an Android developer, you must you may submit a privacy policy for each of your app. When users browse your app in Google Play, they will be able to review the privacy policy before downloading your app. You will need to determine what makes the most sense for your app and your users. The privacy policy field is an additional tool that will allow users to better evaluate the apps they wish to download. Um, how may I edit it? Okay, what if I don't want to add a privacy policy at this time? Then you don't have to, but you can always change it later. So it doesn't really tell you. So it's not. It's definitely not canned. You know, they don't have a canned privacy policy that you can just say, okay, that one. So you have to basically write your own, or you know, uh, copy that from somebody else, or you know, do something about it. Yep. And you always just stay and say like, you know, I'm not responsible for anything. <laughs> <laughs> like the open source, you know, the open source license is like that. You know, we it, it's open source. We are not liable for anything, you know, as a result of using this software, right? Um, but I think in this case, because it is storing user data, um, you might want to make it explicit. That the device, you know, does store your diary cards, you know, unencrypted on the device, but does not transmit it back to the server. There's no transmission. Yeah. Right. There's no transmission in this case, but because it's on the device itself, which means if the device itself is hacked by somebody else, either you know somebody physically getting access to the machine, uh, popping the SD card <laughs> or something like that, you know, that information can still fall into the hands of somebody else. And as a result, you know, that might be a problem. Now, it is not you as a developer who's getting that information because it's not on your server. But I would still, you know, cover my, you know, legal bacon and make sure that, uh, you know, there's a policy statement somewhere so that people understand. Yes, I understand that, you know, my information is stored on the device, unencrypted. So if anything happens, you know, I already know it's, you know, on the device. So I, I would definitely, you know, make a privacy statement for this. Now you can probably Google for you know sample pro uh, privacy policies. So you can look at you know, Android uh, privacy statement. That's probably the same thing that we were looking at. Yep. That's not helpful. Maybe we should add a sample. Ooh, free privacy policy generator. That sounds legit. <laughs> <laughs> Please enter credit card. <laughs> Click here to get started. Create, copy, add. Okay. We just need your email address. <laughs> We just need your credit card account, social security number. Okay, that looks better.
okay this one is a little bit different because this one does use a lot of you know, websites so they have a lot more to talk about because you have to deal with third-party cookies and web beacons and basically all kinds of stuff they can do online to track you so in this case you know, it's a lot more lengthy how to write a website privacy policy how to Privacy policy is a document telling visitors to your site, in this case people who download your app, what information you collect. Now in this case we are not collecting anything, but the device is. The device is storing. What you do with that information, very simply, it is a short explanation of what you're doing to observe visitors to your website. In this case the app doesn't do anything to upload that information, but it is storing that information on the device and it is probably a good idea to disclose that in the privacy policy just so that you make sure that people understand that is being done. Okay. Now on the other hand, if you do have you know a website and people are uploading stuff back to you or somewhere that you have access to their information, then you have a lot more to write about because now you have to you have to explain what you are doing with all that data that you're collecting. Because in this case, I'm not collecting anything. I don't get to access that data. It is stored remotely on the device. But if you are collecting that information, you really have to explain what you're doing with that information. What about bug reports that a user can do within Android that sends back to the developer? Does it send back the, the data files too? I'm not sure, but it may uh, do like system state, like the memory, heat, stuff like that, possibly. I would imagine that the bug report mechanism itself has its own privacy policy and you have to mm -hmm. click it in order to you know, send your report. You basically have to acknowledge, yes, I'm, you know, I understand what kind of information I might be sending and I you know, use this checkbox to acknowledge and say, yes, it's okay with me to send that information. Because that is not uh, app dependent. You know, it, you're you're sending thing, things that may not be reported at all, you know, to the app itself. All right, so we'll go ahead and click this. The app has been saved. So that means at this point, if I go to the App Store, I should be able to find it, or maybe uh, Google needs time to evaluate the app and you know, decide whether to post it or not. So let's go ahead and take a look. So we have store listing, um, pricing and distribution. Oh, okay, so this is a free application. We can just go ahead and distribute in these countries. You have not selected any countries. So we'll just go ahead and select. I have to make it free since you made it with uh, Apple Letter. Hmm? I should have liked it since you do it. That's a good question. Because it is under the open source license. Okay, here is the this is the the thing about open source. You can sell Debian. Okay, so I can go to Debian website and download you know all the ISO files, and then you uh, burn you know, a whole bunch of DVDs, and I can legitimately legitimately sell you know, the the stack of CDs on eBay. Okay, if I want to charge like two hundred bucks. <laughs> for the stack of ISO files that I burn, I can do that. The only thing that I have to do in that case is I also have to include uh, the copyright notice for open source. In this case, you know, with the the Linux, you know, um, license, I have to include that in on my eBay ad so that people would understand. Oh, okay, I'm paying two hundred bucks for open source software, so I'm really paying for the convenience of not having to download and burn these ISO files myself. So that, I think, has to be disclosed, but you can charge money for it. Uh, you just have to make sure that people understand that it is open source and they can get to the source code for free as well. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Does everybody understand what I'm talking about? So just being open source doesn't mean that you cannot charge money, it, but you do have to disclose the license of the software once it is open source. 
can be open source with the condition it cannot be uh, sold in any manner. In the license itself? Yeah. I think you can make your own you know, open source license like that, but the GPL2 uh, version 2 does not preclude the sale of the product. Mm -hmm. or you know, the, the, It does not preclude um, making money in the process of distributing open source software, I should put it that way. I mean, otherwise, how can Red, uh, Red Hat make money? Right? I mean, it's making money through the distribution and also the support of open source products. All right, so in this case, you know, I'll just go ahead. You have not selected any countries. Do I have to? I would assume so. Otherwise, no one will get it. Okay. So let's just limit it to the United States. Why would you want to limit it? Well, because I'm just testing it. Well, the reason why they have this choi these choices here is because you know you, if you write a particular program, and you know it's the concept or the idea may be patented, then you want to limit this list here to countries that you think are not affected by the patent, because patents are not international. So when you file a particular patent with the USPTO, it is only effective in the United States. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So if you have a really brilliant you know, software patent, um, or somebody else has a really brilliant idea, and has a you know, patent that's pending, but it's a US patent only, that means you know, the software or the idea, if you write an app using that idea, it can still be you know, sold elsewhere in the world because you know, it does not apply to the other countries. Okay, so that's one potential reason why you want to limit you know, the market. Yep. What does the show options do for United States? And you can limit distribution based on carriers. So you can say you know only T-Mobile, T-Mobile. You know if you you know if your app is specific to T-Mobile, so you can limit it by carriers. And in this case, you know since I did not you know specify limit distribution to these carriers, do you think by default it's letting everybody have it, or do you think by default it's not ha letting anyone have it? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's vague. It is very vague, because you know, if you don't select anything, that means you're not limiting, right? Because if you say limit, then it is saying only to those particular you know, carriers. Well, they don't have a carrier like a tablet. Exactly. Let's or by default, you're saying I think so. I, I think you know the by default it's okay without you know any specification here. If you select at least one item, that means you know it's going to be limited to yeah. that carrier. But if you select no item, that means everybody can have it. They had it the other way around. The people with the Winnebago's would not get the opposite that anybody would see. Uh, <laughs> okay, so we'll go ahead and just select nothing here. Uh, Google Play for education and. We'll and find out what it is. A destination where schools can find great educational content in Google Play, bulk purchase, and instant distribution. Let educators bring your apps directly to classrooms and schools. All right, so definitely it does not apply in this case. Consent, marketing opt out. Do not promote any, do not promote my application except in Google Play and in Google owned online or mobile properties. I understand any changes to this preference may take 60 days to take into effect. Okay, I'm going to check that. Content guideline, it meets the Android content guidelines. Okay, so let's go ahead and, this is important. Okay, content policy. Our content policy applied to any content your application, let me just kind of zoom in a little bit here. On link to including any ads it shows it to student users as user con generated content it hosts on links to. Further, they apply to any content from your developer account which is publicly displayed in Google Play, including your developer name and the landing page of your listed developer website. 
In addition to complying to these policies, the content of your app must be rated in according with our content rating guideline. So we talked about this already, about the content you know, policy. The policy listed below should plays an important role, blah, blah, blah. Be sure to check back from time to time. Okay. We don't allow, okay, in this particular case, you know, okay, let, let's just you know, go through each and every single item, you know, just so that we know the, the extent of the, of the guidelines. Sexually explicit material. We do not allow content that includes nudity, da 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 da. Google has a zero tolerance policy against you know, child sexual abuse imagery. If we become aware, we will report it to the appropriate authorities and delete the Google accounts of those involved in the distribu distribution. So that's a legal thing, you know, as far as you know, Google is concerned. Uh, violence and bullying, depiction of violence are not allowed. That is kind of vague. Yeah. Okay, because you know you can. Some people can argue and say, you know, Angry Birds is violent, especially the the enhanced you know, versions of uh, Angry Birds. You know, you have you know Jedi's you know slicing you know pigs and stuff like that. Suicide bombers. Suicide bombers. Yeah. <laughs> you basically want to get blow up the crowd, so. so that is really really kind of kind of vague. Hate speech. We don't allow content advocating against groups of people based on blah 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 blah. Um, once again, it can be vague. Okay, so there are you know definitely gray area in these cases. Impersonation, deceptive behavior, um, personal and confidential information. Now this one is kind of important because you know how would my app you know you know touch on this particular item. We don't allow unauthorized, okay? The keyword here is unauthorized, okay? Basically, you do not let the user know about you know, this stuff. Publishing or disclosure of people's private and confidential information. I would say diary entrants kind of fall into this area. Even though it's a little bit gray, I would still say, you know, for safety purpose, you know, it falls into this carrier and this category such as credit card number, government ID, driver's and other license number, non-public contact, or any other information that is not publicly accessible. Okay, so Because my app has an option to add additional urges, that can be considered you know, pri private information. Yep. But you're not publishing, right? Or does that mean saving it? Does that I'm publishing? saving it only on the device. I'm not publishing. Right? Correct. Intellectual property, don't infringe on the intellectual property rights of others, including patents, trademark, trade secret, copyright, and other proprietary rights. Now this one is a big one, because even though it doesn't seem like a big deal, it can be. Because when I refer to DBT, okay, just the term DBT itself can already touch on intellectual property. Okay, Whoever wrote the original paper on dialectical behavior therapy can basically say, you know, without my consent, you cannot even refer to the term DBT. Or you cannot claim that your product is related to DBT. Okay? So you have to be very careful, you know, about this. You know, in fact, if I want to really publish my app and make it available to people, you know, actually have people to use it, I have to make sure that, you know, I clear this particular end uh, item too. Yep. And does that also include how you code it? That would be the patent. Okay, you know, how you code something, you know, relates to the patent of um, the, the software patent, basically. Um, for instance, JPEG encoding is patented. Okay, the method of how to compress an image to a much smaller, you know, file is patented. That means you are, you don't have to copy and paste code from somebody else to you know, basically step on it. You just have to use the same idea to you know, infringe on the patent. So software patent is a really kind of slippery slope, you know, because um, huge comp companies like Microsoft, Google, Oracle, now that it has acquired you know Sun, they have a huge arsenal of different types of patents. In other words. If they really want to turn on you as an individual developer, they can always find an excuse. <laughs> okay, that's what software patents are really useful for: is to launch, you know, big, huge, drawn-out, you know, wars between these giants. 
or if they want to kind of step on an ant, they can also do that. <laughs> okay. Does everybody understand the impact of you know, you know software patents on individual developers? Okay. So let's say you know. Go ahead. What can you do to really like watch out for people that use That's really not a whole lot you can do about it because if you think that you have a really novel way of doing something in software. The only protection you have is to search online and see if you know a patent has already been done to cover the idea that you have. Okay, uh, but a patent search, you know, is not necessarily an easy thing because the way you term your ideas and and, and concepts and whatnot may not be the same way as somebody else, you know, terms. So when you search using your, you know, your own phrasing, you may not find the other article. Um, or the the patent that is actually you know mentioning the same approach of doing things. And yep. Well, okay. Let me let me let let him ask the question first, and then I'll come back and address that one. Yep. Plus, it may be included into like a blanket term or uh, summary <laughs> versus actually just saying this part. It may just be like in the range of that. So you want to turn in uh, find it yep. through that method either. Yep. Yeah. So the so patent search can be very challenging as a result. Now I can tell you something. You know what kind of ideas or concepts you know uh, these software giants are trying to get patents for. This whole concept of a pager. Microsoft was trying to get a patent for that sort of thing, in I think the late nineties. Okay. But that concept has been around, you know, since X Windows, okay, you know, for, since the really early version of X Windows, uh, which is you know from the late '80s at the most, okay, possibly earlier. So Microsoft was trying to patent something that has been around for a long time, and it tried anyway. <laughs> and sometimes it is awarded, you know, with patents that it really should not be awarded with. Um, so it's really kind of. This is just Google covering its own, you know, legal, you know, bacon, you know, to say that, you know, okay, we are not responsible for you, you know, infringing on somebody else's patent. In fact, if you do that, we'll do something, you know, to make sure that, you know, we don't get into any trouble. So you got to be a little bit careful about this. Um, the other thing would be trademarks and trade secret. You know, trade secret is something that we normally don't have to worry about, unless you're working for a company. And you are stealing the company's you know, trade secret and turn it into your own app. Now that can be a problem. Um, trademark is interesting because um, you know, what actually constitutes a trademark? Okay, some of you own your own business, so you know what a trademark is. Um, there are also Okay, I can give you one example of being able to get into trouble. Okay, if you in your app as a silhouette that looks like this, guess which company can come and can come after you? Disney. <laughs> Disney. Yep. All you need is three circles placed appropriately. They sued somebody about that. They did. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. There are companies who are particularly, you know, you know, stringent about this. You know, they have a huge big you know, legal department just to <coughs> do stuff like this, and they have to justify their existence. So they actually go out and seek, you know, for you know cases to sue and sue the you know, people to sue. Um, typically, if you have something like this, you know, they won't sue you right away. You know, they will give you a letter first and say, you know, your content. Is infringing on their trademark, copyright, or patent, or something like that, and you have to cease, you know, doing that. You know, you have to pull your app or something like that. And if you do not comply, you know, then they will threaten you with a lawsuit. Okay. So things like that, you know, would be, unfortunately, would be things that you know we have to, you know, really think about before you publish an app so that everybody can access it. And then there's DMCA. Okay, the DMCA is um, Digital Millennium 
uh, Copyright Act, and that by itself is also an interesting read of you know what constitutes you know a uh, copyright infringement. Um, so you have to you know, you know kind of watch that too. Illegal activities keep it legal. Don't engage in unlawful activities on this product, such as the sale of prescription drugs without a prescription, and so on. And I'm pretty sure these examples exist because people try to do that. <laughs> Otherwise, there wouldn't be explicit examples. Uh, gambling, we don't allow content or services that facilitate online gambling, including but not limited to online casinos, sports betting and lottery, or games of skills, skill that offer prices of cash or other value. The key part here is, is other value. Yep. Yeah, because you could have like online credits that have no real value, but it may have value within the game. Exactly, because you can always convert the value somewhere else into cash. You can trade it somewhere else into cash. Uh, dangerous product. We don't allow content that harms, interferes with the operation of, or accesses in an unauthorized manner, networks, servers, or other infrastructure. Now that is interesting because in Linux there exist commands while used in a certain way can be used to do all of these things. <laughs> if you know bash how to do you know basic scripting and you know how to use you know command line tools to open sockets, you know, to you know, to start a network connection, you can potentially do all of these things without a special app. So the question now is, you know, what makes your product, you know, step on this particular, you know, landmine um, when there exist tools already in the operating system in Linux that can do some of this stuff already if you know what you're doing. I think what where do you think that borderline is? The, the, If your app has a button that says launch attack, it probably falls into this category. <laughs> okay. On the other hand, if your app, you know, basically just refer to the terms of networking, okay, like I don't know, um, test port at this IP address, okay, that may not, you know, you know, step on this particular landmine. Okay. But if you do thousands of them at a time. If your app has the ability to repeat and do thousands, you know, of those you know, at a time, then yes, you know, that and intentionally. Okay, then be a label to <laughs> Well but what if you're 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 writing a, te a load tester? If you have a load tester, which is a legitimate you know, kind of tool to test, you know, whether a website can handle, you know, how many requests can it handle, and also what kind of system load will be generated, it definitely would basically, you know, operate in a way that can potentially interfere. Now the question is in an unauthorized manner, but in this case, authorization is not related to your app. Okay, I could be testing the power server, right, and I want to write an app to do it, and I think. Well, maybe other people want to do something like that too to load test you know their servers to make sure that they can handle you know a certain type of load. Um, but somebody can turn it around and use it to attack, let's say, Wells Fargo's website, right? Obamacare. Hmm? Obamacare. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's crowdsourcing right there. <laughs> um, so that's kind of based on the user. It's based on the user, but your app cannot. I would say if your app has any type of suggestive words related to, you know, the unauthorized, illegal type of use of your app, then you know it's not good. Okay, if you Definitely just word it. yeah, you just have to word it the way it is. Okay, do not add intent to the buttons. Okay, so instead of you know launch uh, DOS attack at this address. <laughs> You know, it may be okay for my load testing software to say specify number of requests, okay, slider, okay, and then here's the button to basically say, okay, load test, you know, the URL listed in this text box, okay, because load testing is not an issue. I mean, that's a 
it's some, that's something that people actually should do to their website, you know, to make sure that it can function under a certain load. Okay, so kind of slippery slope. You know, you got to be careful. You know how you phrase your app, you know, or items in your app to make sure that you don't um, get into this this mess here. Don't transmit viruses, worms, defects, Trojan horses, malware, or any other items that may introduce security vulnerabilities to or harm user devices, <coughs> applications, or personal data. Apps that collect information, such as users' location or behavior, okay, you know, so the DBT app definitely is going to collect information without the user's knowledge are prohibited. So if I have the very first screen of my app in red, bold text, to say that, yes, this information is stored on your device, unencrypted, do you want to proceed? Then it is no longer without the user's knowledge. In fact, my app doesn't have an, has an option to uncheck or you know, to bypass the first screen. Every time the app starts, the first screen pops up first. Okay, so that makes it, you know, that makes my app not fall into the category of dangerous products. But without that first screen, it can potentially fall into the dangerous products, you know, category. Yep. Uh, going back to the gambling, couldn't any company that builds a game really be sued by Google because the word value is subjective? Anything can be value, value for anybody. True. So if they don't like you, they can sue you over anything. Well, you can you can even you can even go to the extent and say you know shopping on Craigslist is always a gamble, yeah. right? Sometimes you get something that's better than the you know, better than the asked value, and other times it's worse. So, it is subjective. But if you have any type of actual gambling game in it, or you know have ways to place a bet, you know that will make your app you know very you know close to this line. So it all depends on how you phrase it, and you know. This is really just you know Google's way of you know making sure that it's you know it is Google covering its own, own exactly. So that's why you know they have to do something like this. Um, if your app is not an actual gambling app, or that's not the intention of it, um, you just have to make sure that you know you don't. Put any words in your app that is suggesting you know that it's a gambling app. Yep, go ahead. Would it be uh, infringement to steal other people's user agreements? Like it'd be like you know you use like every day. Like, <laughs> <laughs> just like just conglomerate all of them and throw them on yours. That's plagiarism, but I wouldn't call that you know infringement because I don't think you can um, copyright <coughs> copyright statements or that would be kind of funny copyright and <laughs> copyright statements. Because um, I, I don't think that that would be an issue, you know, if it's a privacy statement, you know, I don't think you know they can copyright that. Did you have a question? Or point? Yeah. I was just thinking, uh, what if you you say that you store the information on the device encrypted, but the encryption is very weak. Weak. So anyone that spends five minutes on it could decrypt it. But that was, you still have to let people know yeah. that you're storing that data. Even if it's encrypted, you still have to tell people that yes, I'm storing your data, it is encrypted, but it's being stored. Um, you know, in my app, you know, it's all in plain text, so I make it very clear that all this information is stored on your device in plain text, and you know, if you think this is a security problem for you, you know, a privacy issue for you, do not use this app. You just have to make it clear. Uh, malicious scripts and password uh, phishing scams are also prohibited in, on Google Play as are applications that cause users to unknowingly download or install applications from sources outside of Google Play. An app downloaded from Google Play may not modify, replace, or update its own APK binary code using any method other than the Google Play's update mechanism. That's a that, that leaves a really big loophole. Go ahead. Yeah. What if like you have an advertisement in there and that generates a download of another application or redirects you to a web page? But that is not done unknowingly. No, you you have an advertisement there, but the advertisement uh, company gets hacked and they 
put malicious stuff in there and your app unknowingly, unknowingly becomes malicious. Becomes a tool for yeah. the for the intent of the hacker. You will have to consult, you know, actual yeah. lawyers for this, but from my perspective, you know, you should not be held liable, you know, because of that. But lawyers will always try to push it as far as you can. Okay, I'll put it this way. If we are the way we are, you know, taking a class in a community college, I don't think any lawyer will be coming after us anytime soon because we have no money. <laughs> okay, but once you start to make a lot of money, yeah. then you have mm -hmm. to worry about it. We are not worthy to, you know, these you know, lawyers. I mean, it's like, why do we want to sue you? Yeah, you have a stable job and whatnot, but we are not getting our millions of dollars like right off the bat. You know, yeah, I can collect my money over 30 years, but they don't want to wait. I mean, these lawyers want to make money like right off the bat. They're going to move on to someone, you know, who has more money. Well, if you're an in-house attorney, you get paid no matter what. Sorry? If you're an in-house attorney, you uh -huh. get paid no matter what. So if a big corporation wants to see you for some reason, they don't care if they make the money. And they have attorneys are paid no matter what. In the case of that, it's for a different reason. Right, it's for protecting its own intellectual property. So, but in that case, they're not going to sue you right off the bat because they don't want to waste money suing you either. So they will send you a letter to try to scare you to pull your app and you know, or stop using you know, that picture or stuff like that. Um, but they're not going to sue you right off the bat because you know to launch to start a suit you know against you, they're going to use up some money. So even if you lose the the, the suit, you know you have, you don't have a whole lot of money to pay Disney, right? I mean. And you know, as far as they are concerned, it's not worth you know you know trying to sue you like you know, right off the bat. They just want to you know scare you off, you know, send you a letter which is next to nothing you know from their cost perspective. And you know if that does the job, you know it's okay. Okay, system interference as an, an app downloaded from Google Play must not make changes to the user's device outside of the app without the user's knowledge and consent. When you download and install an app. There's usually a huge laundry list of what the app can potentially do. And when you click, yes, I am okay with that, that is basically acknowledging it. So you have you know, basically the app now has your knowledge and consent. Okay, so it's basically saying, you know, you know doing things without, you know, letting people know, you know that your app may be doing that sort of thing. This is, yep, go ahead. I've noticed that when you agree to that, those sections are like very have like a very wide category but they, they don't really say it. it's like network access or that uh, needs to access your content your a contact list but mm -hmm. the reasons for that is com something completely unrelated yes but that has to do with how uh, some some of that is not you know someone trying to get yeah. you know unauthorized access or more access than they need to it's because you know they are bundled so to get some little thing done they need to have you need to open up you know, a whole big port in order for one little thing to be done. Yeah. This includes behavior such as replacing or reordering the default presentation of apps, widgets, or the setting on device. If such an app, if an app makes such changes with the knowledge of the user and consent, it must be clear to the user which app has made the change, and the user must be made. The user must be able to reverse the change easily, very subjective, or by uninstalling the app altogether. So when you uninstall the app, it has to undo its effect on these particular things, setting of the device, widgets, apps, placement, and stuff. Does, a, does removing an app actually initiate commands, or does it just remove the app? It would, if you uninstall an app, it will remove the executable and also the data storage associated with it. Now, if the app has made changes to something else, I don't think those changes are automatically undone. Because the system doesn't store the state before the change automatically, so you know some of the changes you know would not be automatically restored. Then it'll be difficult to implement that. Your app has to be able to keep track of its own changes. Yes, the, the app will keep uh, track of its own changes, but if you go in, uh, go into like uh, your listed application and install it there, mm -hmm. then how would it un undo those changes before it's uninstalled? Um, in this case, okay, the, the phrase says, and the user must be able to reverse the changes easily, 
or by in, uninstalling the app altogether. Okay, so so by uninstalling the app altogether. Okay, I see. Reversing the changes easily and <coughs> uninstalling the app altogether are to basically undo the the changes. That's not clear to me. Yeah, I, I was looking at that. Does it really? It, unless you can vaguely written sentence. Yeah. Oh, never mind. I'm not. I'm just not sure what this or is applying to. Yeah. You know, because it must be able to reverse the change easily. What is the or applying to? Okay. So that's vague. Um, apps and their ads must not add home screen shortcuts, browser bookmarks, or icons on the user's device as a surface to third party or for advertising purposes. Um, you know, you don't have to worry because App Inventor doesn't have the ability to do all of this stuff here. Apps in, and the ads must not display advertisement through system level notifications on the user's device unless the notifications derived from an integral feature provided by the installed app. Apps must not encourage, incentivize, or mislead users into removing or disabling third-party apps except as part of a security service provided by the app. Okay. And then we have you know, another laundry list of you know, additional stuff here. Network usage in terms cannot create unpredictable network usage that has an adverse impact on this user's surface charges or an authorized carrier's network. So that's why, you know, with a lot of apps, especially ones they can use a lot of bandwidth, they would, by default, um, turn off network access if it is on 4G or 3G, okay? When it's on Wi-Fi, you know, the default usually is okay, it's okay to upload you know, the pictures. Like Dropbox, how many people have Dropbox on your devices? Now, Dropbox has the ability to automatically upload, you know, your gallery, you know, onto the Dropbox website, <coughs> which is really handy. But the, the the feature by default is disabled, and even when you enable the feature, it is also by default not using your carrier's bandwidth to upload the pictures. So it will wait until you have Wi-Fi access in order to upload the picture. You actually have to go into the settings and say, yes, I'm okay with using my 4G bandwidth to upload the pictures to actually use the 4G bandwidth to upload the pictures. So that's basically what this is talking about is, you know, you want to make sure that if you have a large uh, bandwidth requirement in your app, you have to make sure that you, know, you let the user know and by default do not let it happen. So pe people actually have to go in, change the settings in order to make it happen. Uh, spam and placement in the store, basically it's basically you know, saying do not post repetitive content, do not use irrelevant, misleading, or excessive wording, keywords in app description, titles, or metadata, and so on. It's just, you know, don't mess around with our, you know, search engine. <laughs> Um, do not post an app where the primary functionality is to drive affiliate traffic to a website or provide a web view of a website not owned or administered by you. Do not send SMS, email, or other messages on behalf of the user without providing the user with the ability to confirm content and intended recipient. Okay, so a lot of this has to do with informing the user, you know, what your app is about to do or what it has done and so on and so forth. So, you know, that may be helpful. In my app, you know, in the DBT Diary Card app, it may be helpful, you know, after you know, people actually hit the save button to actually save the content, to provide a little dialog box and say, this entry is now saved, but it is in plain text, it is stored on your device, just to be sure that you know, they get that constant reminder every time they hit the save button, they understand, oh, okay, I'm storing something on my device, it is not encrypted, and it has you know, information about my habits, my emotion, my feelings, and stuff like that. Paid and free application, app purchases. Um, developers charging for applications and download from Google Play must do so by using Google Play's payment system. Um, this is actually kind of interesting because it's Almost the same thing as you know, eBay saying you have to use PayPal. Okay, because in this case it's saying you know you cannot have an alternative payment method um, when people use your app. I have seen that. 
okay I have seen apps where you download the quote unquote community version of the app and it will display you know ads and stuff like that and then there's a button that says okay if you don't want the ad that the ads or if you want to contribute to my development effort hit this button and that button will link you to PayPal or some other forms of payment and upon conf confirmation of the receipt of the money the app can turn off its advertisement you know part of it okay and what this is saying is you cannot do it okay you know the app is not supposed to do something like that any type of payment must be done using the Google uh, Google Play's uh, payment system yep is that any type of payment or payment to purchase the application well, de developers charging for applications and downloads. So, charging for applications is kind of more general than just you know downloading the app, because you know, what if you want to enable a feature in an application? Would that be would that fall into this category or not? The okay, that may not be related to app purchase, but what about in-app mm. purchases, right? I mean, the next one says, okay, here you have the app already, but what if you want to make additional purchases that is inside the app already? So you have already purchased the app or you have downloaded the app for free. Developers offering virtual goods or currency within a game downloaded from Google Play must use Google Play's in-app billing services as the method of pay. Okay. But this one is specific to within a game, okay? And my app is not a game, so it does not apply to me. If you are writing a game and you say, okay, in order to upgrade your armor or your, your sword or your spear or whatever, you can pay me, you know, like $20 and I can upgrade your, you know, armor. Uh, so it's plus five, okay? Um, that has, you have to go through Google Pay's, uh, Google Play's in-app billing service. Okay, you don't have an option. If you do any, if you choose to do it in any other way, Google, basically Google says we can pull your app. Yep. Is that just for like the uh, mainly for like say your kids get on your tablet and down, uh, download <laughs> a bunch of uh, goods and spin up like a nine thousand dollar bill that they can reverse the charge? I don't think that's for your protection no. <laughs> <laughs> because every time you pay somebody using Google Play's in-app billing service. Yeah, they get a um, piece of it. The, it gets, exactly, they, they get like two or three percent like PayPal does. Okay, and that's basically Google is trying to secure its own income stream instead of saying, oh, you can use PayPal or you can use, um, I just found this one out uh, a few days ago. What is the name of that app? Now I have to find it. It would also- Dwala. Dwala, Dwala, Dwala. That's it. Yep. It would also protect their name uh, through, uh, from apps downloaded from the Google Play Store uh, for billing purposes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they have more control and they get you know, everything. Uh, this is one that I found. This brings up a little interesting point because, okay, well I'll talk about that later. Uh, Dwala is you know one of the uh, basically it's kind of like PayPal except you know the uh, fees are different um, so this is this is a selling point no percentage no percentages no hidden fees 25 cents per transaction or free for transactions that are ten dollars or less so if you have a charge if you want to pay somebody else let's say three thousand dollars it's 25 cents extra to you know, as a fee okay PayPal wants three point something percent Okay, if you have a merchant account, if it's paying, if you're paying for goods instead of um, uh, gift, you know PayPal wants you know three point something percent, and it's usually on the other side. So when you're receiving money um, by delivering goods, you have to pay PayPal you know three point something percent um, of that money. Must you qualify for this, or is mm -hmm. it just for With the general public? For Dwala? Yeah, it's general. You just need a bank account to use it. Um, so it seems to be pretty legit, you know, I have uh, some people who uh, mentioned that to me and go, well, this, is, this may be the next thing to do. Developers offering additional content, services, or functionality within another category of app, meaning not games, from Google Play, must you also use Google Play's in-app billing uh, service as a method of payment, except 
where payment is primarily for physical goods or services, or where payment is for digital content of goods that may be consumed outside of the application itself. Okay, so this is good because you know what I was about to say was, um, I'm, I think I mentioned this to you guys. You know that um, a the biodiesel co-op of Sacramento. You know they contacted me and want to write an app so that people can pay online and you know manage their you know account online. I'll be fine. I'll be okay not using Google Place in app building surface because in this case um, it's actually physical goods. Right? You're buying diesel. Biodiesel is physical goods. So it is not, you know, it's in, in, the, in the exception clause here. What if in the DBT, DBT app, you know, I also want to um, have a button and say, if you want to you know, contact a uh, therapist, you know, we have a list of therapists or you can pay for that service. Well, it's going to be okay too. If I want to use Dwala, it's okay because it is, in this case, services. You're not buying something to enhance the application itself. You're not paying to enable or disable certain things of your app. Okay, it's a surface that is outside of the app itself. So in those cases, it's okay not to use Google Place in-app billing service. But if you're going to enable a feature, disable a feature inside the app itself, then you have to go through the in-app billing service. Are we doing okay so far? Yep. <laughs> what if you tie it together? Like, uh, you pay for a uh, good or service, like a little token, mm -hmm. and included with that enables or disables features in the app. Hmm. Then it depends on the interpretation of the word primarily. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because you know it's vague, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's it is kind of vague. Um, Google is basically just saying that you know if we need to shut down your app, we can use any one of these excuses to shut down your app. Yeah. Okay. Whether it is actually constantly going through every single app to see whether you know any one of these clauses apply, I don't think that's the case. I don't think it has the manpower to do it, nor does it actually want to do it. Okay, you know, as far as Google is concerned, you know, basically the more people want to use you know, the Android operating system, the better. So they don't want to restrict you know, apps unnecessarily you know, unless there really is a reason to shut it down or pull the app. All right. Subscription and cancellation. Google's subscription cancellation policy is that the user will not receive a refund for the current billing period when canceling a subscription, but will continue to receive issues and updates of the relevant subscription content, if any, for the remainder of the billing period. So it doesn't really apply to my app here because I'm not, you know, offering any type of subscription. You or the content or service provide access provider may implement a more flexible refund policy with your users directly, and it is your responsibility to notify your users of these policies and ensure that the policy policy comply with applica applicable law. Um, there are multiple applications that I have installed that has a refund uh, button on display after I purchase and install the app. Um, so I think that is an option that the developer has chosen and say, if you don't like it, you know, within a certain time period, you can just hit the refund, you know, button, which will probably uninstall it and then, you know, um, you get your money back. Okay. All right. So we're running out of time today, but I think we have just gone through a whole bunch of items in order for you guys to understand, you know, um, what you have to do, you know, what you have to consider when you are about to publish an app. Um, do you think in the long run it's better to have a refund button as far as how much money you're going to make? I don't think, I think having the refund button, you know, definitely helps to make uh, the purchaser happier with you as a developer. So even if your app really sucks, but having that refund button and being able to say, oh, I don't want this app and just hit a refund means the end user may be willing to try another app from you in the future. Maybe when this app is more mature, you know, the person will come back and try it again. But without the, the refund button and your app you know, sucks, or if the user doesn't like it in any way, 
the negative feeling can connect to you as a developer, so that end user may de may decide I'm not going to download or install any more apps from you any you know, in the future. But if you have a refund, you know they will say, well, you know I can always give it a try. If I don't like it, just refund. Yep. I think you still have the option through the Google Play Store, but it's within a certain time frame of right. downloading it. Yeah, but I think some actually has a refund button on the Google Play screen itself as opposed to having to go through Google App Store oh, to do actually that. on the the app page itself? Uh -huh. huh. Yeah, on the app page, I've seen that. Um, you can actually you know, do a refund, but it's only within a certain limited amount of time. So yeah. I'm not sure whether it's Google Play doing it or whether the app actually has to do certain things to say, okay, we have a more generous or more liberal return policy or refund policy. Maybe you just uh, have the option to add it up front right. through the, the configuration of the uh, app uh, page. Yep. Yeah. Okay, policy enforcement in the event that your application is removed from Google Play, you will receive an email notification to that effect. If you have any questions or concerns regarding a removal or a rating comment from a user, you may contact us at this address. And I can almost guarantee you that nobody is reading your email. <laughs> Serious or repeated violation will result in uh, account termination, and you can also end or end up in uh, account termination, and so on. Nothing really, you know, surprising here. They just say, you know, we'll get rid of your get rid of your account. That's all. Yep. Is that just for the Google Play account or your Gmail account as well? Because they only say account termination. Yeah. So if you look at it from the legal perspective, you always assume it's the most general interpretation, which will be your Google Gmail account. <laughs> they may choose to only disable your uh, Play account, your developer account. Um, but you know, if it doesn't say specifically, then I think you should make the assumption that they can get rid of your actual Gmail account. Alright, so I'm going to stop the recording now and um, 